Hey friends, this is Allison Steele, and you're listening to Unravel with Allison, a show where I take a concept that's got me in knots, and we unravel it together. Thanks for being here. Let's get started. Today, I am wound up about golden rules. Let's unravel. We were taught a golden rule in kindergarten. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Pretty simple, easy to do. I tried sometimes, but mostly I was just in response mode, as you would typically expect from a kindergartner. Anyway, the summer I revisited my rules when I realized that the bar was too low. A quote was tossed around the internet and landed in my lap. You stop explaining yourself when you realize people only understand you from their level of perception. I found it interesting. The comments were filled with agreements. I started to look for it in my daily life and I found it to be mostly true. I closely watched the situations where I needed to explain myself. The first New Year's Eve that I can remember was a really good example of this. So I was told about the start of a new year and how we would all count down together at midnight as the ball drops. And I asked a lot of questions about the ball drop. I was given straightforward answers that I still couldn't really comprehend, but I tried to. So we were going to a family member's house. This was like a New Year's Eve party. And I wondered if they had to set it up, which is why we had to go to their house. So like what I came up with, we had these, you know, two or box TVs. And if you can remember the mousetrap game, like our family never played it because it was too complicated to set up. I thought maybe it was something like that. Like they would have like flip on a switch and we'd see like the shadows of a marble or a ball, like dropping in an interesting mousetrap style of grandiosity. So when I watched the ball drop, I was like, oh, this is a show. It's showing us just like TV shows us stuff. It's a show. Why didn't they just say it was a show? Like, it was so obvious to me that they should have known how to describe it to me. Yet it was so obvious to them that if it involves a TV, it will be some type of show. (laughs) Like, there's some truth about only understanding from your level of perception. So I was reminded of another thing we were taught in school when my buddy posted on Facebook. We live in a country where half the people, left and right, woke and non, get offended if you don't respect their sensibilities, but don't care about yours. The other half just wants to watch the world burn. Of course, there's going to be a World War III. I had to let that one marinate, but the next day I responded, remembering that back in public school, they taught us conflict resolution with like this little Mad Lib. I feel when you, I need you too. We clapped along with it. That's how they taught us to remember it. So an entire generation was raised to believe that boundaries were the responsibility of the other party. We were literally raised to give away our power. Imagine if we were taught genuine, powerful boundaries. I felt when I need to for now. Taking the responsibility and putting, putting the resolution back on yourself. Or even better, can we discuss this from my perspective? I'd appreciate your insight. It's far more inviting than explain yourself or make it make sense. Growing up, I believed both the kindergarten golden rule and this conflict resolution model were beneficial. And it was so ingrained that it was like a default response. So during a fairly recent misunderstanding, I used this model and I was met with halting honesty. I was told that I was understood and that I was loved, but that the expectations were unrealistic and then I needed to figure out a way to handle this one on my own. They were having a hard time keeping up with all of the boundaries in line and felt like they were just walking blindfolded in a sea of Legos, like there's no winner. I have done this in every single partnership I've ever had. And this is the first partner who was able to tell me, okay, that's a you problem in a way that I could actually understand. But I had to sit with it for a long time. So what is a problem? At work, I learned that you're either part of the problem or part of the solution. So to combat that, I keep the ball rolling, look out for the next guy, and you just do the next right thing because you know how the system works and um, you know how the system breaks. So you keep the system working. In 12-step rooms, I learned that if you're not the problem, there is no solution. And you really shouldn't be handling problems that are not yours. <laughs> So I've been working from this baseline victim mentality where people are supposed to accommodate me because I can't handle it otherwise. I read all of the books and like I could tell you all about the five love languages. I try to accommodate them too. And that's what I thought we were doing here. Like I thought that's how we solve things. I thought that's how we maintain love and peace. But it doesn't actually work like that. 
When I stopped to evaluate what like my actual problems were from that 12 step standpoint, I stopped worrying about things beyond my control. So my what ifs at that time were essentially like planning how I would maintain my grace when I'm inevitably going to be met with discord. My mom suggested that I turn my what ifs into so what's. So instead of wondering how I would behave under these wild circumstances that almost never developed anyway, it was like, so what if I am met with that? I'm, I already know what that feels like. I already know what to do about it. So why even factor that into the process? I know how to handle that situation. So what if it happens? Then it does, and then I deal with it, and I can't really do anything else about that. Turn your what ifs into so what's. Basically, I decided to just start like elevating my mood and choosing to maintain it. And I know that this seems silly to a lot of people because that's how a lot of people just exist. But there are a lot of revelations I've had recently that have all boiled down to the simple fact that I do not give myself permission to exist, to feel worthy of the seat at the table that I'm actually sitting at. So to sum it up, people only understand you from their level of perception. That's what we're running with here. My level of perception of myself was vulnerable, nervous, a victim who was sometimes brave enough to pass as competent, and sometimes I had fun, but mostly not. I admire others, and I enjoy being with them, and I believed they were worthy of so much more that they were worthy of the courage and the bravery to stand out and be themselves. And I didn't care too much to be myself because it made me feel like I was part of the problem. So I just kept trying to do the right things. I worked hard to be perfect. You would never really be able to tell it though, because I was taking on too much to maintain my sanity. I was giving myself high standards and low value and I treated myself like garbage and the system runs itself. So I treated others how I treated myself like garbage and I was hurting people. I know that people who are hurting tend to hurt others. Hurt people hurt people. I've held a lot of hurts, so I try to avoid more hurts, and I tried to protect others from being hurt. I thought I was an ally. Really, it's just a constant cycle of looking at my situations and other situations and confusing, they can't handle this with, they shouldn't have to deal with this. Both of those things are statements that I believe to be true, but then I'm taking the power away from somebody when I assume that they can't handle something. I pitied everybody and felt sorry for everybody, and I put them in victim shoes because those were my shoes. And with everyone I've ever hurt, I know that I never intended to hurt them. I never went out of my way to cause harm to somebody else. I I can't say never. We've all done some stuff, but... Big hurts, not just the little pranks and stuff like that. Those really, really, really big ones. Um, The biggest heartbreaks that I've ever experienced with another person, I never intended to hurt them. And I was only ever trying to save myself. I used to lie a lot too, but that got too much to keep up with also. And the truth was always an easier alternative, even when it didn't seem like it. So I would just started taking ownership of my behavior, acknowledging that I was trying to work on it. But when I was running late to work, instead of saying like, oh, there's a traffic jam, I just apologized and said like, I don't know why I'm like this, but I'm trying. Please don't fire me. And then when something genuine happened that set me back, it sounds like a lie anyway. Like when you just open the door to leave for work and a dog runs out and now you have to chase it down for the next 20 minutes. Those are just stories that like people don't believe, even when they're completely true. So it doesn't matter if I tell the truth or lie, because I can't control whether or not they believe me anyway. So it's easier for me to keep up with myself to just tell the truth, because it's typically, it's just not worth the lie. But again, I only lied when I felt like something precious to me was at risk. I was never trying to get away with anything or pull one over on anybody. I was only ever trying to protect something. So I have realized that hurt people hurt people and scared people lie, and it's easier to forgive others when I generalize my experience this way. I bunched this together and added it to my golden rule. We don't hurt people on purpose. Treat others the way you want to be treated. This kind of serves as a precursor intentionally. Like if I'm going to treat others the way I want to be treated, it's important to remember that when I'm also hurting. It reminds me to value myself at a higher level so I can continue to value others at a higher level. When we remember that we're humans, our problems and mistakes are valued opportunities to strengthen our resiliency. 
problems don't exist. We only have opportunities. We don't hurt people on purpose. Treat others the way you want to be treated. This also reminds me that when it seems like someone is trying to hurt me, or it seems like or is quite obviously clear that I have been lied to, I can see that that person is not doing it on purpose. I see how they're doing it for them and not to me. And it's possible that they're just trying to save themselves. I really believe that we're all doing our best where we are with what we've got. So if we're doing horrible things to each other, we're feeling horrible things inside. And it doesn't excuse the terror we inflict on each other, but I genuinely cannot see it any other way. We think we like a good comeback story and that we're rooting for the underdogs, but we're pushing everyone into a position where we could eventually see a bunch of those stories, but instead we've decided that people are canceled and unworthy of recognition. We're instantly devaluing humans when they hurt others and it's not really helping. We feel placated when we're served these PR rendered generalized apologies, but what, what else is there to say? These people come out saying, I would like to apologize on behalf of my behavior. At the time, I didn't understand the impact of my actions. I've been shown the error of my ways, and I apologize to anyone I've hurt as a result of these behaviors. Additionally, I appreciate the courage of those who chose to step forward, and I will pursue further education on this subject. That is about the fullest you can get of an apology of somebody fully taking ownership for it and still acknowledging those they hurt without calling them victims, and they almost need to call them out as victims for the apology to be considered worthwhile, and I just can't, <laughs> I can't get behind it. The apology takes all the responsibility and we're still canceling people and boycotting their next move. When they double down or lean into it, they're still canceled. So what difference does it make? We talk a lot about how like Americans are three missed paychecks away from homelessness, but we don't talk about how we're one mistake away from public annihilation. And that's not even something the government really controls. This is just what we're doing to each other. There is no grace for a comeback when we decide that people are irreversibly destroyed by another's actions and should spend the remainder of their time on earth living in the hell that they created for another. And that is not justice. I can't tell somebody to rot in hell. I can't get behind Eat the Rich. I get it, but I can't get behind it. True justice is not judgment and prosecution. Today, our country values free speech with the understanding that you're not really free from the results of your speech, which I think is absolutely insane. Not saying that the rules are insane or whatever, just like those two statements together being a true thing is insane to me. Our country values free speech with the understanding that you're not free from the result of your speech. Eh. And while I'm at it, our nation was established by Puritans, and we forget how much of an influence that still carries. So we're, like, embarrassed by history of, like, which trials and the he said, she said, like, which is it, you witch? Here's an impossible task that'll end you, unless you are this monster, which you say that you're not, but we think that you are. That is our present-day justice system. It's hard to value that. There is no way out. True justice is realizing that everything just is. We can't control other people, but we can make it better or worse for each other. And I don't believe we should be making it worse for other people. The only thing you can ever truly control is yourself. The physical and mental health conversations are kind of hard for me too um, when I step away from that victim mentality. I realized how resilient I was and how I was diagnosed with things that were presented as like this forever fire that I would have to keep an eye on because there's a potential for it to flare up even when I'm good. But I felt okay because I had pills and mental skills to keep myself in check. But then these symptoms would arise and I thought like, here we go again. You're never free from this. And, you know, to offer some perspective here, when I was in high school, I was like put into an inpatient pain program for chronic pain because the doctors just didn't see a solution to what I was dealing with. So they just taught me how to live with it instead. Again, this like forever victim, here are some tools, send me out into the world, good luck. But once I saw that this like forever diagnosis that I thought was like stamped on my forehead, it just was a stamp, like stamps in a passport, a state of being a state of existence, a state that I visited. When I want to travel in the real world, I choose a destination, get in a car and go there. I can be a traveler. But in our minds, we can travel. And in reality, we can travel. And in both places, we're surrounded by tourists and fellow travelers. 
fellow travelers are down with the ever-changing states. You can keep up with each other. You can flow together. You can separate, come together, and all is well wherever you are. You realize that you are the other and you are opting into an experience where the tourists are the other and don't really get it. So they're gawking and heckling and acknowledging and taking pictures and exacting and insisting. And these are like the present day Puritans. We're like, look, this is what it is. And we're like, no, but it's this. They're like, nope, which is it? Because I see it this way. So it must be this. Like that is tourism. That's not your home. You, you can't define things for everybody. We can only see it that way for ourselves. But we have to stop insisting on other people to get behind what we believe to be able to participate with each other. We need to quit waiting for the bad guy to finally reveal himself. It doesn't exist because everybody actually wants to be the good guy. I watched a video interview of this schizophrenic teenager recorded, I believe, like in the 60s. And it was this Q&A where the interviewer was trying to understand why this guy was so fixated on playing a piano. I kind of understood his behavior like immediately because he's responding very specifically to the exact question that he's being asked. But he's not expressing emotion or offering an appropriate response. The doctors and parents are concerned because like this kid is fixated on playing the piano. He knows exactly um, how he wants to play for a crowd. He knows exactly how he'd like to sit. He imagines this scenario constantly, which is absurd because he doesn't even play the piano. So he looks dead inside. But I think maybe inside is the only place that he's actually alive. You stop explaining yourself when you realize people only understand you from their level of perception. I wonder if anyone bothered to ask him how he'd like to perceive. I wonder if they were so stumped on the subject that it's all they worried about. So that's all they asked him about, and he answered exactly. Maybe they couldn't see the person through their fixation of the subject. Maybe he was tired of their obsession, so he stopped explaining himself. Maybe they couldn't accept his existence without defining it, so he stopped expressing it. And I wonder if anyone ever sat him down on a bench in front of a piano. I wonder if people who are neurodivergent are just called that because that's how it's perceived, but it's actually like the opposite. Because when I think about divergence, I imagine like a stream flows off from a river and every boundary we put in place creates like this flow chart of what we believe to be true. And the stream dries up. And when that main source can't maintain the divergence, I think that's kind of how like our neurons compartmentalize within our brain. So when you hit that dead end, that's when something feels like a problem when you can't match if this, then that. It's far too much to constantly monitor, which is why people kind of get stuck on things that they don't understand. We call things we don't understand crazy, but I don't think that crazy actually exists. I think we choose to not understand if we can file something into an easier defined category like crazy or unwell or mentally ill, just not worthy of being taken seriously rather than unexpressed or not yet understood. Maybe if seeing a crazy person makes you feel unwell, maybe consider a new definition that sits right with you until you can feel comfortable around them. Our sensory information is sent through neurons. The neurons deliver information to the brain to process and then to explain breath sends, you know, a message back out. So it's like this input output cycle that needs to stay in balance, just like any other system. I like to generalize possibilities so I can make quicker connections in my brain. And it seems like I'm out of touch or off topic. We're not paying attention because we kind of speak backwards. So then we process backwards. Like if someone is trying to describe a giant blue octopus stuffed animal, like that is so many things to think think about. There's so many colors for the template of stuffed animal. It'd be easier for me to process if somebody said there's a stuffed animal. It's a whale. It's blue. It's this. It's that. Because I know how I, like I see the template and I fill it in. So it's hard for me without a template to have the fill-in information. And it's like, okay, here's all of the ingredients. Where's your pie? I don't know yet because I haven't really got there. So it takes me kind of a minute to catch up in conversation. And it seems like I'm not wired well or that my wires are kind of in those dried out states. What I've actually spent time doing is flooding my brain with connections so that when you give me those descriptors, I have such a vast pool that I can tap into to color this template, but I don't know what the template is. So I can't pick the right descriptor that you first delivered me until I know what the template is, but then I have to wait for your sentence. So then I get the template and then I color it in. So then I'm like, wait, what'd you say? Oh, never mind. I got it before you even have an opportunity to ask the question again. So maybe it's just a breakdown of communication and like some of us just kind of 
see the world backwards, but it's presented, it feels like it's presented forward to everybody else. And it seems like we have a lot of like emotional disturbance, but I think that's because we're not offered as much output because we can't really share with people at our level of comprehension because there's too many possibilities factored in for us to kind of really get to a point, but maybe the point doesn't matter and the expression does. So maybe we just try to like make a little bit more space for that with each other. I realize that I miss a lot of opportunities to experience people based on my limited beliefs. So I label people as crazy or monsters or victims or heroes, safe or unsafe, well, unwell, healthy people do this, healthy people do that. I labeled everybody because that's how this brain works. The more you're at ease with though, the easier life flows. But when you're stopped by a belief, you literally don't think it's real. And then you have to define it as something because you can't comprehend it for what it is. A while ago, a friend posted on Facebook about who is your least favorite actor and why. And I immediately thought of Joel McHale because I do not like his characters. He's a good actor, but he plays a jaded punk who gets off on making people look stupid. And at the time, I thought like straight up people like that do not exist. Like that's not real. Genuinely, I believe that people didn't act like that. But of course they do. But I realized at that point that I passionately avoided anybody who gave off any of those vibes to the point with I do not interact with that archetype at all. I dismissed that entirely. I thought that these people literally don't exist because they broke my rules. So I factored them out of my existence. I don't participate with the whole entire archetype of person if I met with it. I thought that these people don't exist because... He broke my rules. He hurts people on purpose and we don't hurt people on purpose. He doesn't treat other people the way they want to be treated because he doesn't treat himself well. So like these rules still didn't quite make sense because I wasn't accepting people for who they are. I was still dismissing humans. But I started watching Community again with this perspective and Joel McHale plays um, Jeff, who is... Uh, who embodies all of those character aspects that I described before. And I don't know if it's addressed in the show at all, but the internet applauds the character Abed as like high functioning, well celebrated neurodivergent representation. Having had the previous discussions about like the schizophrenic teen and this like Facebook prompt, we watched the first episode of Community. And when Jeff meets Abed, my partner asked me if I was seeing Abed in a new light this time. And I kind of didn't because I understand that like Abed knows exactly what he decides he knows and he speaks the truth and he monitors his speculation like Abed makes sense to me. But I was enlightened when Jeff was enlightened and he viewed his interaction with Abed as an experience instead of an encounter. Jeff tells Abed, I see your value now. And Abed says, that's the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. And I could identify with both of them in that moment because that's the missing piece is that the golden rules aren't rules to live by or ways to behave the what would Jesus do narrative. They're checkpoints to keep yourself balanced. Like I'm careful with my words because they're important to me. So when I abide by something that I don't understand, I consider myself taught. I know the right thing to do even when it doesn't feel right. This feels taut, tight, tense, like a dog on a leash. And I abide because I get to participate when I do and I like to participate. But there are things that I'm taught and there are lessons that I have learned. And I consider the learned information more valuable because they were established through lived experiences. These are these little resiliency side quests where we come out on top or we come to an understanding that puts us at ease. So when you lessen the impact of something, you've learned your lesson. When the impact is lessened, it puts you at ease. It's easier to tap into when you need to consider it because the neurons associated with that part of your brain also send behavioral triggers to ease your body and your body prefers to be at ease. Instead of looking at life as a story, we just meet people where they are so the if-then scenarios don't matter so much when you consider what else is possible. When I was in first grade, we were preparing for a stage performance, and it was an assembly for the entire school. It was called the Three Piggy Opera, and I stayed after school to practice for a dance number that was going to be at the end of the show. And it was voluntary, but it felt like a special thing because, like, not everybody was doing it, and I was really excited for it, and I tried really hard. During the actual performance, like when we're doing the choir part and we're all standing on the risers, I look out and I make eye contact with my brother, who's in the audience because we go to the same school, and he's two grades ahead of me. He and I are notorious for laughing at inappropriate times. Like, we make eye contact and we just lose our mind. Like, there's an invisible monster tickling us and we're just 
like this is ignited by us making eye contact. And like sometimes we would do it on purpose. Like if we're holding hands in like a prayer circle about to eat Thanksgiving dinner, like he would squeeze my hand and it would make me laugh. And it was just always us like terrorizing the tension in the room. (laughs) Or I'll say the energy. It wasn't always tension, but it was us like absolutely hijacking the energy in the room. And most times like we weren't trying to do anything. It wasn't like a telepathic thing where like I knew what he was thinking. So like we were both in on something, but it was more like just instantaneously we found something better to do and something better to feel. And it was uncontrollable. And the more we got in trouble for it, the funnier it was because nothing was happening. Like it absolutely seemed like we were up to something suspicious, but nothing was ever happening. And I never understood what was going on, but it was just like something we bring out in each other. Anyway, standing on the risers. I make eye contact with my brother, lose my mind. (laughs) Like I am looking back and forth between my brother and the instructor and she is heated. She gives me that look and it gets worse and I'm cracking up, disturbing the show until I'm pulled off the risers and like I instantly snap from laughter into absolute embarrassment, completely horrified. I couldn't, I was in tears. I was sobbing. I was devastated. It was embarrassing. I hated it. Ugh. Okay. So then I settled down. I'm like, okay, but I still get to go back out for the dance at the end, right? Nope. Because we have to like punish kids. So um, I lost my privilege and that didn't make sense to me because I still put on all the effort and I still worked really hard. I got to a point where I couldn't control what was happening around me and I know I should be able to. And I know it seems if I tried hard enough or if I cared enough that I could have fixed it but I was in first grade and I didn't really know any better. And I just thought that I still deserved to dance. So I'm like, I'm just a little jaded, man. I was devastated. I wasn't allowed to do the dance routine that I stayed after to practice for and tried so hard for. I literally never wanted to be on stage ever again in my entire life. But that school was kindergarten through sixth grade. And I attended first through sixth grade. An assembly that was held every single year was the lip sync contest. The sixth graders signed up to do a lip sync routine and a panel of the teachers judged the performances and chose like first, second and third place winners. It was my favorite day of every single school year. And like to this day, when I'm scrolling through Facebook and I see people from like the different grade levels, my first thought is, oh, I remember their lip sync song. It was just such a big deal to me. And when I was in sixth grade, I had already planned about like 50 routines over the years because like I wanted to do this thing. <laughs> we formed a group and we were really excited to get started. And I don't remember like the exact specifics of how this played out. The essence of the story as follows. <laughs> Three of us signed up together. And after signups were done, one of our friends moved back to our school And we begged them to let her join our group and she wasn't allowed. And it bummed us out because she was just as excited and nostalgic as we were. And she was a total showman. Like she was the one who, she was the actress, you know, she was the one doing plays in theaters and she was used to the limelight and she sings so beautifully. She was always turned up to a hundred and had just like a free spirit, man. (laughs) Um, Like so much so that like my parents fondly, I believe, called her the trucker mouth. Like she just brought it always. She deserved to be on stage. But she wasn't allowed to. Anyway, she hangs out with us and helps us with choreography. And we're still all doing it together, even though we don't get to do it together. One of the girls in our group gets sick, like chicken pox or something to where she's not going to be allowed to come back to school for a few days. And like we're in crunch mode. So we're under these circumstances and school's like, okay, the friend can take her place. And we had a full like designers make it work moment where like we brought it. We made it work. It still felt absolutely terrible to leave a team member out who also deserved to be on that stage. All of our parents were still kind of involved and like helped us with these showy ideas and props and decorations and costumes and like hitting all of those judges criteria. We presented a pirate theme to Gwen Stefani's Rich Girl. And on the day of the performance, I was like, damn, dude, we finally made it. We are here. And it's such a weird dichotomy, though, because I was so excited to share this with my team and I really wanted to win. But I was also really excited to be doing this with my classmates because we all sat and enjoyed this together over the years. And it's like a specialty group that opted into performances and it felt special and extra special because we're doing it together. But sitting on the bleachers waiting for the show to start, we're all giggling, asking each other questions about our song choices and displays and who's in whose group. And it gets weird. 
like where we start competing in that moment and all information is off limits until the performance reveals itself. And I hated it. And (laughs) I started getting anxious like we were just judging each other and I only expected the panel to judge me. We took the stage and I felt like the first grader that was like taken off in tears. And I don't even know how I convinced myself to start dancing, but I did. And I was rigid and I was embarrassed and then I got over it and then I had fun. So far in that kid's life, this was the best day of her life. And she was really proud of herself that she didn't let her team down and she pulled through and we didn't look stupid. So after everyone performed, there's still this uncomfortable quiet when we're still competing with each other, anticipating the results. They announced the third place winners and I cheered genuinely because they were really good. And I figured though, if they got third, there's no way we placed because even though like I danced and lip synced the whole time, like I was supposed to in routine, I didn't really try, like I didn't bring it until about like halfway through. So I'm sure the judges could tell. (laughs) They announced the second place winners and I'm like, okay, this is it. Yeah, we're not placing. I'm just excited because like I'm watching some of my favorite people that I'm not really friends with and like they're winning and it's cool because they did a good job. I'm the audience member that I've always been and I'm just like eating this experience up. But my teammates are sitting with me and like we're holding hands, hoping to hear our names. I'm preparing to like console them. (laughs) And then they announce us as the winners. And you would have thought my friends just won an Oscar. They were like, oh my God, yes. All this hard work and perseverance paid off. I can't believe we pulled it off. It was such a roller coaster. And the documentary writes itself. And I didn't feel like I won an Oscar. It was like I was in Oprah's studio audience. I was being sent home with a new car. So when I'm in a mood, I call in something else that I can tolerate. And I find something that I'm willing to live with. So for example, a couple summers back, I had long hair and it was always in the way and I didn't have time to do anything about it. So I always put in a bun or ponytail and it was just, it was a nuisance to have. So I get off of work one day and I walk next door to the barbershop, tell them to cut it all off. They did. And I got this cute little pixie faux hawk and I adored it. I loved it when I left. So I had to style it. But I'm looking in the mirror trying to figure this out and I like don't really know what me looks like with this style. And I absolutely despise that feeling. And this wasn't anything new. My mom's a cosmetologist. Always growing up, I've had access to having crazy hair and I've mostly opted for having crazy hair. So my mom hated doing my hair because I always cried when she gave me exactly what I asked for. I just told her like, I don't know, it's not right, even though it was precisely what I wanted. There's just that part of my brain that didn't recognize my reflection as me yet. And I never knew how to verbalize that discomfort. So when I get all this hair cut off now, I couldn't really see myself in myself yet. But I saw how when I wore it like kind of natural, it was like Winona Ryder from Girl Interrupted. Back in high school, my prom date said that I looked like Winona Ryder, but like from Mr. Deeds. And that just felt like very insulting to me at the time for some reason. But it was really coming in handy at this point that I was like, oh, so somebody thinks I look like her and she's kind of cute there. So I can um, pretend to roll with that. And then when I actually like did my hair and styled it, it was kind of like, it looks like Johnny Knoxville and love that spirit, man. I was cool with that too. I can get behind that. So when I was getting ready for work, instead of like fussing about my hair, I would just decide whether I was going to be like a Winona or a Johnny, or if I just like needed to put a bandana on and walk away. But either way, I outsourced the part that I couldn't understand until I could live with it. So I wondered maybe if this is like a false idol kind of thing where like honoring others is golden, but not being able to find it within myself. So I'm like, I have to outsource the goodness to let it apply to myself, even though I'm the one in control of the whole production. So why do I even add these extra steps and give away all my power? Just this weekend, I thought about my general state of awareness and how I still call up these examples outside of myself to justify my position. I'm keeping up with the Joneses, but I'm the one that can't keep up and the Joneses don't exist. And I started just reminding myself that I'm worthwhile and that I can pat myself on the back when I'm proud of myself and I share it with the world. And I haven't even gotten over the stage fright that is like sharing art or my thoughts openly and freely. And sometimes it does feel impossible, but in those moments, I just remind myself of all of my powerful moments where I was truly proud of myself and decide that they're a result of my presence. Even when I didn't think things were possible, the fact that I showed up was enough and I got to learn along the way. But I'm conflicted about sharing my art and my thoughts basically when I'm stuck in considering how I want to feel on stage. I don't need to try to call in Meryl Streep. (laughs) I want to call in like lip sync Allison at halftime when she showed up. And like my body doesn't have to integrate that energy because it already created it 
and remembered it itself. So it comes back easily. When you're willing to associate with the impossible and you define the impossible, when you make sense of stuff that doesn't make sense to you, I would just encourage you to make sure that it sits right with you. If it doesn't feel good, it's probably not your truth. The golden rules were my truth checkpoints, and I made sure to monitor my checkpoints more often. I made this agreement to myself that it was safe to be open to new ideas and consider thoughts beyond my belief system. I never thought I would have to say a sentence like that to myself, but at some point I forgot. So again, I made an arrangement to myself that it was safe to be open to new ideas and to consider thoughts beyond my belief system. Rain Wilson posted a book this year called Soul Boom, Why We Need a Spiritual Revolution. I haven't read it, sorry, <laughs> but I caught him on a podcast while he was promoting the book, but he explains like his inspiration as he was like raised in the Baha'i faith, which he describes as inclusive and universalist of all spiritual beliefs, like we can all exist together kind of thing. So I kind of like went to the Baha'i.org website and they highlight um, this message here. O ye children of men, the fundamental purpose animating the faith of God and his religion is to safeguard the interests and promote the unity of the human race and to foster the spirit of love and fellowship amongst men. Whoever is raised on this foundation, the changes and chances of the world can never impair its strength, nor will the revolution of countless centuries undermine its structures. Okay, so I comprehend this simply as any religion worth practicing should encourage the unity of the human race. Just to simplify it real quick, I know that it's way more than that. Unity of the human race is an idea that I can get behind of like what a religion should be. He encourages the younger generations to create a new religion and like encourages potlucks because like getting together is important and like you don't really need a reason behind it. But if you're going to pick one, food is good. So like you don't have to be anything, but you're offered a seat at the table. Even though I grew up in churches, I stayed far away from religion, but I valued this new perspective. And I valued it because I valued other humans and other humans valued it. So I had to consider what makes religion so important. So I considered what religion I would create if I got to build it. Primarily, it would be most important for me that people meet each other where they're at. That's what Jeff and Abed did. They understood where each other fit within their belief systems and they found value in their interactions. If we can do that, we can share space with anyone. It's possible that future generations won't even experience suffering and anxiety and worry if we don't insist on the caution of it all. If we help them to learn lessons and to harness their instincts instead of following taught arbitrary rules, maybe we'd have less tension physically and socially, but sometimes when we feel like ants in a world of giants were completely powerless, like we could be crushed at any moment. We retreat to these underground societies and I just dream of resurfacing. I dream of a world where <laughs> like money, time, structure, and suffering literally don't exist. Um, and there are no bad people to be wary of. The awareness is safe in the present moment. We recognize and operate within like an inherent differential value system to where like we have a different view and different values on purpose. And that's how we're able to like spark each other's interest and create new things. Can't even tell you what happens when we get there because the coolest part of this dream is that we all get to decide how to proceed together on purpose with purpose. Maybe I could like work really hard on something all day and be super productive and feel really good about it. But then another day I could stay up all night without worrying about throwing off my real world productive sleep schedule when I just like got inspired by something and I wanted to spend 12 hours on it. What would be so wrong with it? Nothing because hours don't exist and you're not the sum total of your production. That sounds really nice. Maybe people who are like stuck making money for shareholders, working their butts off, having no time to enjoy a meal, their thoughts, a vacation, like these people finding solace and excitement only in like these weird little foot fetishes or something where like in this dream, they would be cobblers. They would get to spend time with the feet and they would get to honor the feet and they would take care of the feet and they wouldn't be weird about it because they were free to enjoy it as it exists on its own, that it doesn't need to be abused because it isn't restricted. It just feels sometimes like we don't get to explore anymore, like it takes up too much time and if it doesn't do anything in the future, then it's not worth spending your time on now. 
But I think everything that we do and try new brings in new ideas and new ways to conceptualize and easier ways to live. So maybe if we were allowed, we would just inherently find what we love to do and learn from others. Like children who, children would be like welcomed into workshops to like practice and to discover what the world has to offer by community members who are excited to share their specialties with the next generation. Like we value the generations. (laughs) There are no child labor laws because we don't abuse children because we value them and we are excited to see what they're capable of developing next. We don't fear on their behalf because we don't terrorize each other and there's nothing to fear. We honor all humans as capable beings. And if communities develop like this, cool, that's great. If they develop and each member disperses and there are no traces left of their existence, that's fine too. Authority is only important in the moment in my dream. Credibility is irrelevant. Inspiration is appreciated. Everyone is welcome to develop their own understanding and what to do among it. And that is like my perfect slice of heaven. (laughs) But when I'm met with something I don't understand, it's like I find myself labeling like my checkpoint is when I label someone with something I wouldn't want for myself. Like, oh, poor her. She must be devastated. Or I overstand it. Like I see how someone is dealing with an issue that is breaking their heart. And I see how that problem doesn't even exist. Like the potential for something to play out when, yes, that way is possible. But so are a million other ways. And if we can't control it for me, that problem doesn't exist. Yet they're expressing it to me. So for me to point out my perspective, will dismiss this expression, which means I don't get it. So even though I think I really get it, I don't get the point of it. And the point of it is like meeting them where they're at. It's important for me to adjust mind to just stand it, to tolerate it, to not feel like that standing in it and tolerating it is overwhelming for me. But instead, we just offer space to continue to express without insisting on the resolution or judgment or explanation. And we just sit in dark spaces. And by the time you get it out of your system, the problem is expressed and it's out. And people usually feel better and move forward when they hear it out loud, when they speak it out loud. The religion that uh, Rain encouraged me to create and the religion that I now practice and the change that I want to see in the world, my little holy trinity as this follows, <laughs> meet people where they are. We don't hurt people on purpose. Treat people the way you want to be treated. And please note that I have not mastered this. This is cyclical on purpose. So I have more opportunities for better experiences, which is all I want in the first place. I want to do better. I want to be better. I want to feel better. And I don't have to hate myself while I do it. I don't have to fear others while I do it. I don't deny the ugly of the world, but I explore it and appreciate the understanding even even when it's hard to digest. So I'm not ruled by my world unless I forget my rules. But when I'm reminded, I try to even like remember that it's worthwhile to meet it with this energy surrounding this purpose I've created for myself. It's important to set the tone for yourself. This Sunday, I went to church and I've only been to one other service this year. And it was a long stretch between that time and the previous. And I don't agree with a lot of what is shared in those rooms, but I appreciate having a new topic to consider. And there's like a mini concert. And I always want to cry when a lot of people are in a room feeling a lot of feelings together. I cry at almost every church service because the feeling of love overpowers everything else. Like no matter how delusional it may seem sometimes, like you can feel in those rooms that people are changed and cleansed. You can sense that even if you don't value it. The more I'm exposed to, the more I'm able to understand others' perspectives. The church is about a 30 minute drive from my house. So I initially had a podcast on, but then I turned it off because my thoughts were just too loud. Work this out before I sat in this room. So this is when I spent all that time complimenting this like stage presence elementary school thing that I that I talked about earlier. It was this whole drive to church that I'm thinking of like, man, when I was little, this whole thing was happening. That's nuts. <laughs> the whole drive, I was thinking about how far I've come and how much easier it is to see myself as the strong person when I felt like the weak person. I arrived and I met up with my friends and I discovered that the kids were putting on a Christmas show. So like in the past... I might have like considered that a wasted service because like I don't have a kid on stage for this. It's like um, on The Office when Toby wants to go to Pam's art show, but his daughter has a play that night. And like deep down, he loves Pam. But, you know, to the camera, he is like, yeah, I want to go support local art. And what what those kids are doing, man, it's that's not art. (laughs) So like I kind of used to agree with that, but like would realize that 
you know, kids are never going to get good at anything if they don't start somewhere. But it's usually like intolerable to the senses when you get a group of them together for these kind of things. And it's cute. Don't get me wrong. But it's cute when um, it's like when you have a team to root for. I didn't have a team to root for. My oldest kiddo, though, he's a senior in a school district that has a really high regard for the arts. And I have been I've been like so impressed by him and his peers. When I was in high school, I was always in choir and band and like we had competitions. Um, We tried. We had fun. We did well and we were pretty good, whatever. But these kids are out here crushing competitions. And I, I still cry when I watch them perform because I'm so overwhelmed with like the grandiosity of their shows. And I enjoy the heck out of them because I know that like his skill level as a freshman just absolutely blew my skill set as a senior out of the water. So proud of that kid. (laughs) Anyway, (laughs) the pastor encouraged us to like clap and sing along because like these kids have been real hyped about this performance. He wants us to keep that alive. And this church uses technology. So they have like a big display screen and they use visual aid slideshows and stuff like that during the sermons, whatever. They live stream the services. So they have they have the video on and audio coming through for this event. The cameras were focused on the kids and then the display was projected behind where the kids were standing. And like the whole performance was super super tolerable having like without having a kid in the game they played the songs over the loudspeakers and like didn't seem to really have the kids mic this is sounding mean but it just was tolerable is the nicest way to put it and it was cute because they were using like a lot of hand gesture choreography and like you could tell the kids were having a good time and it was fun to watch like what kids you could tell were like doing exactly what they were taught and which ones were going with the flow and which ones were embodying the teacher and which ones were not participating and which ones were just laughing because they're like this is goofy it was cute So the kids walked off stage and were like prompted to clap for them and their instructors. And before leading into the sermon, the pastor thanked us for our participation as well. And then points out how much fun he had watching the kids when they realized that they were on the screen behind them. I could not tell you how refreshing it was to see him meet their like discovery with amusement because... They were not behaving like we expected them to, and they weren't doing anything wrong, and it was okay, and it was really nice to know that that exists for these kids, man. (laughs) Another post I saw on Facebook was uh, somebody asking if it's weird to give yourself pep talks because he does it, and it seems kind of crazy, but like it works. So (laughs) everyone agreed that it's like necessary to maintain your sanity, and even if it feels crazy, it's just the opposite. Like, I thought it'd be interesting to record hours of myself giving a genuine pep talk and just listen to it in my sleep until I believed it as a default mode. Is that crazy? (laughs) I don't know. It's kind of what I'm doing here, these like little pep talks to myself because I need it. Six months ago, if I were handed a microphone, I would have been in tears. I hated the sound of my voice and I felt like I had nothing worthwhile to share. And now I share with myself and value my expression. And I only share this because I believe in the pep talks and I believe they mean the most when they come from within. But if you're unable to tolerate yourself right now, you're welcome here. The first podcast I ever recorded was about reading the Bible. I had a unique take on it when I decided to read it for the first time and I had nobody to talk to. So like the people who were willing to talk about the Bible were not interested in my perspective because that's not what it means. And they weren't willing to discuss beyond their belief system because it wasn't worthwhile for them. Whenever I'd bring up the Bible to somebody who didn't have a reference point, like sometimes they would listen to me, but they didn't really value the Bible. So I couldn't, I still couldn't really have a discussion. My partner encouraged me to do a podcast about it since I couldn't shut up about it. And I did. And I loved the experience. So I started with the Gospel of John. So then this Sunday at church, when the pastor dove into the sermon, he covered this exact scripture that I had touched on in my podcast. And I finally had a new perspective to consider with something that I already had an understanding of. And it was an awesome service to attend that helped me bridge this gap of like my horrors of childhood stage performance with what these kids were doing. And and what their futures might hold in a different light. I held it together because I was with other people, but as soon as we parted ways, I was in tears. Life is just too cool to pass up because you don't believe in something. It's okay to think beyond your belief systems and you actually like, you have access to way cooler conversations. It doesn't have to be exact. 
And on that note, remember that I'm a person sitting in a booth talking to myself. Part of this practice is reminding myself what I'm about. I don't have many opportunities to discuss this in my day-to-day interactions. I trust my understanding of this whole sensory cycle, and I really feel like expression is a necessary part of the interconnection. All of this to say, these were worthwhile prompts for me to consider, and I'm not encouraging any listener to get on board with what I have to say or how I choose to believe today, because it's likely and hopeful that this process is fluid and ever-changing. I'm engaging my senses by speaking out loud, hearing myself, and expressing the feelings that I most care to revisit, and it's golden. Thanks for listening to another episode of Unravel with Allison. If you have any feedback, questions, want to chit chat or stay up to date on new releases, follow me on Instagram at Allison K. Steele. Let's keep in touch. Again, thanks for listening and I'll catch you next episode.